Hello, good evening, and welcome to our last bulletin for the day. We are live from the news hub at Adesawe Kanda in Accra. You can also watch TV3 live on your DSTV channel 279 and on our Facebook Live and on 3news.com. I'm Stephen NT. You can feel free to post your comments on our Facebook pages at facebook.com slash TV3GH. Let's now start with the major news highlights of the day. Police in the Upper West Region have commenced investigations into the 55-year-old Burkina Bay national who was arrested with a shotgun in a Catholic church in Hamile in the Upper West Region. The man who is said to have suspiciously entered the church during the first mass service on Sunday, June 2nd, triggered the action to interrogate him leading to his arrest. And Vice President Dr. Mahamadou Baumia has lauded the two traditional leaders in Saboba and Chiriponi districts for taking steps to resolve the communal conflict. Dr. Baumia said government is ready to meet with the two parties to seek amicable resolution to the conflict in the area. And tonight, government says it is revising the existing cyber security policy and strategy to be responsive to current challenges to meet the international best practices and standards. As a first step, the National Cyber Security and the Interception Bill will be introduced to Parliament this year towards addressing the legislative gap. On President Kufuado has called on Ghanaians to change their attitudes as a way of addressing perennial flooding. The president who was addressing the Ghanaian community in Toronto, Canada said no amount of investment aimed at addressing flooding in Accra will work if citizens fail to change their attitudes to refuse disposal. Those were our major news highlights. Uh, remember, you can hear me on 3FM 92.7. We're also streaming live on our Facebook and on 3news.com. Up next is the big one. Welcome. Now, the Electoral Commission has called off the planned limited voter registration exercise scheduled for June 7. A statement from the EC Monday said the decision stemmed from a pending injunction application seeking to restrain the Commission from going ahead with the registration exercise. One Omar Ayuba took the EC to court over the exercise seeking an injunction. Uh, the limited registration is to proceed a district assembly elections and referendum. It is uh, unclear how the pending injunction would affect the calendar of the Electoral Commission, which has less than six months to conduct the district assembly elections. Right, let's get on to the telephone lines. Uh, we have uh, the team leader for elections at the Center for Democratic Development, CDD, Ruda Ose Afo. Uh, good evening, madam, and thanks very much for joining us. So from your perspective, how will the postponement of this exercise uh, going to affect the registration processes that the AC has started uh, in general? Well, good evening, and thank you very much. Um, First of all, let me just say that um, if you look at the exercise that was going to take place, this is a preparatory activity um, in respect of the district level elections and the referendum, which has been uh, scheduled, which has been scheduled to take place in December, and and which uh, already indicated that there's a stretch of the electoral calendar because the last time we elected our district chief, um, our district assembly members, that was in September. 2015, and so ideally we should have had this in some time around September, and now we stretch it to December. And so they, the, the immediate effect is that this is likely going to have an 
impact on the electoral calendar. And the fear is that if we are able to contain this and then there's a spillover effect, uh, this is going to affect first of all preparations yeah. towards 2020. Yeah. And then also there will, there, there will likely be a gap in terms of the, 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 the mandate of the current um, members of the various district assemblies around the country. However, in the short term, the short to medium term, the, the immediate direct implications will be on, on, on publicity and public awareness. Already, uh, they have run some um, campaigns, publicity campaigns on, in the media. People probably are prepared, and this is an exercise that was going to take place at district level. So some, probably people are prepared to travel probably on Friday to go and, and register at the district um, center. So it will be important for the EC to send information, find the most efficient ways of disseminating this information to the look and cranny of the country so that people are not inconvenienced in any way. Um, in terms of their own logistics uh, personal de deployment, I think that because of the, 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 the mode in which they were going to carry this exercise, there might be some minimal implication because you don't have too many personnel that you, we were going to deploy for this, and also you didn't have too many registration centers. So in terms of replanning and preparing yourself again uh, to, to, to carry out these activities, the implication might be reduced. But the long term, the medium to uh, long term implication, we need to check that. Now, 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 let's look at the decision itself. Uh, do you think the Electoral Commission, in the first place, uh, had to take uh, the decision to conduct the registration at the district level instead of the electoral areas? I mean, this has become the, uh, the, the basis for the injunction. Well, we will need to exercise some caution here because if you look at the, the court petition or the court case that has led the EC to take the decision that they have just done, there are, there are twin issues. So there was an application uh, for an injunction against the commission, and also there was an application which was going into substantive matters, and that was uh, touching on the merits and demerits of the arrangement that they were. So we need to be careful since this is an issue that right. is going before it's, the it's court. It's before the it's court, I agree. Issue. That's very fair. But uh, let's look at uh, the, the case in the court now. Uh, do you get the sense that, uh, maybe I should just ask it this way, how do we uh, make sure that this is not dragged in the courts to uh, likely affect the outcomes of the major elections 2020 we have? Yeah, that, that's very important, and that speaks to how we adjudicate uh, these matters. It speaks to our judicial processes. Um, some of these issues are likely, I mean, they will happen, they will come up all the time, mm -hmm. but the important thing is how our courts also uh, apply themselves to these issues. If you re recall, in 2016, we really had the courts stepping in to, to, to despite some of these issues, to deal with some of these issues in a very, very efficient manner in terms of uh, time, very timely in terms of how they dealt with some of these things. And that saved uh, the, the, the timeline, the electoral calendar uh, towards 2016. So the way in which we deal with some of these issues, as it is, um, do we have an indication of how early the court is going to hear this case? Uh, we don't know. And even if you look at the decision the EC has taken, so there was an application and they have uh, decided uh, upon their own introspection that they are suspending the exercise. One issue would be, I mean, will the mere filing of an application that the court constitutes an injunction for them to, to warrant that suspension? Uh, that's something that we can look into. But most importantly, how quick are we going to have the court to step in, first of all, to deal with the issue of, of the injunction? Because from the understanding I've had, these are issues that should be, we should be able to deal with as soon as possible. I mean, any application for an injunction is something that we should be able to have our court make a determination so that it, it doesn't affect a lot of things. But of course, even after they've made a determination on that, we will still have the substantive issues which will go through a process. And so in a way, uh, eventually will also uh, affect the process. So these are 
some of the related issues that we, we should be uh, but, but, but madam madam will say uh, before you go a quick one i know that uh, there are those who might say that the the case in court is uh, might be retarding the process processes that the EC has set in place for the registration. But would you say that it, it, it actually uh, good for our democracy, for uh, citizens and individuals who uh, feel shortchanged by anything at all, including processes of the Electoral Commission, to head to the court? No, I mean, it's, it's, I mean the, you, it, it depends on how you look at it, but this is, there's nothing wrong with this. Uh, we are dealing with institutions that are governed by rules. We know the Electoral Commission, for instance, is an independent institution, but that independence is not absolute, okay? Yeah. And so for a democratic society like ours, we need some checks and balances. And so how do we check um, um, the exercise of that of the discretion or the discretionary powers of the commission as far as its independence is concerned? So this is not bad in, in and by itself. Right. Um, that's why I was asking the issue, the, I was raising the issue about what filing um, an application before the court means. If somebody files an application, does it mean that by itself that, that, that warrants a suspension? But the other side also is, what if you don't do that and then you go ahead and later on yeah. you are found uh, to have done mm. something wrong and then ultimately the exercise is suspended and we know what happened in 2015 when we're going to have an election in three days, a matter of three days, and just three days before that, we had a court decision that suspended the elections and we lost millions. So it's quite dicey, but I would not say that that exercise of the right of any Ghanaian to challenge the powers yes, or sure. the exercise of the, of the mandate of a body like the Electoral Commission is wrong. It's yeah. not wrong, it's healthy for, for our democracy. Uh, but at the same time, we need our institutions, our, our courts, our court system, our judicial, our judiciary to also help us in terms of expediting the processes for adjudicating some of these matters. All right. Uh, Madam Osei, thank you very much. I wrote Osei for his team lead at uh, the CDD Ghana. I'm Stephen Enti. This is News at 10. You can hear me on radio, 3FM 92.7. We're streaming live on Facebook and on 3news.com. We'll be right back. Please stay. Welcome back. Now, police in the Upper West region have commenced investigations into the 55-year-old Burkina Bay national who was arrested with a shotgun in a Catholic church in Hamile in the Upper West region. The man who is said to have suspiciously entered the church during a first mass service on Sunday, June 2nd, triggered the action to interrogate him, leading to his arrest. The 55-year-old was arrested with a foreign pistol loaded with nine cartridges of ammunition, uh, which he claimed he acquired lawfully in Burkina Faso and produced a license to support that. The Upper West Regional Police have since commenced investigations into the matter to ascertain the motive for handling the weapon in the place of worship. Some worshippers told TV3 that the man came to the church on a bicycle and started behaving strangely, which created suspicion among church members. There has been a uh, recent attack on some churches in, sub in the sub-region. There have been uh, recent attacks. Therefore, the conduct of the gunman uh, put the fear in worshippers, including some Ghanaians. Though security has been strengthened in the area, but Hamile has a lot of unapproved routes into Burkina Faso, which is a major concern to national security. Vice President Dr. Mohamedou Baumia has lauded the two traditional leaders in Saboba and Cheraponi districts for taking steps to resolve the communal conflict there. Dr. Baumia said government is ready to meet with the two parties to seek amicable resolution to the conflict in the area. Here's a report by Zubeda Ismail. The delegation first called on the paramount chief of Saboba, Obori John Bowen Martyr, where the vice president was briefed about the planned meeting between Konkumba and the Anofu leaderships. The vice president next moved to the community center at Chiripone, where he called on all the two ethnic groups to cease fire. From their point of view, they want the fighting to stop. This is the word of the paramount chief of, of uh, Saboba. And the same thing was repeated by the president of Koya. 
and they said that he wants to have a meeting from the, with the, between them and the Kerepone Traditional Council, Your Majesty, with yourself and your chiefs, so that you can really cement the peace. Dr. Baumia again revealed that the presidency will be meeting the two traditional leadership to foster unity and coexistence. Calm has meanwhile returned to the center of the communal conflict, Chirpone, following the bipartisan delegation visit on Friday, May 24, led by the Defense Minister, Dominic Nituwo. The government says it is revising the existing cybersecurity policy and strategy to be responsive to current challenges to meet international best practices and standards. As a first step, the National Cybersecurity and the Interception Bill will be introduced to Parliament this year uh, towards addressing the legislative gap. Ghana has not had a major cyber attack except hackings of government website as worrying as the 2016 Liberian attack was, government of Ghana sees a potential threat. The central bank has recent as 2018 raised concerns on a possible threat of cyber attacks in the financial sector, summed up as concerns. These issues are gaining strength from the Ministry of Communication. The Cyber Security Center is pushing MPs to apprise themselves on the dangers as they await regulations. Somebody might sit in Cote d'Ivoire or Burkina and hack into our system and get information so that they can, you know, do whatever they want to do. So by doing this, we'll be able to identify or when they are caught, there's a legality backing them to prosecute the person. So I think in a broad way, it's going to help all spheres of cyber security. A three-day retreat to build the capacity of members of the select committee in the area of cyber security and to review the draft cyber security legislations, cyber security bill and the interception bill and the revised national cyber security policy and strategy has begun. The introduction of the interception bill is expected to address the current challenges faced by law enforcement and security agencies while ensuring that Ghana meets its international obligations as a state party to the Budapest Convention. We also have a major problem with inadequate human resources and IT skills development in the area of cybersecurity due to the fact that very few people are equipped to handle this menace effectively. The legislations are aimed at establishing a cybersecurity authority, providing a legal framework to effectively conduct cyber-related activities in the interest of the public and protecting critical national information infrastructure of the country. Not much seemed to have changed four years since the June 3rd disaster. My colleague Wendy Lai made a tour of the major sites affected by the incident four years ago and has come through with this report. It's been four years since the June Sweet disaster. As a result of that very disaster, over 150 lives were lost. Property West, millions of cities were destroyed in the fire and the flood. Several recommendations were made. Four years on, I will be visiting some of the points that were greatly affected by the disaster. I'm currently at the Asylum Down drain. And this drain is very close to the Paloma Hotel. It's actually behind the Paloma Hotel. But it seems there hasn't really been a change in relation to the disposal of waste. Now, right here, I can see at the edge of the drain, there are several plastic bottles that have been left here. Exactly May 29, 2019, there was a downpour 
and Circle got flooded. I'm very close to the Providence Insurance Company Limited and this part of the road got flooded. There were several videos on social media and there was one particular one where we saw a man swimming due to the extent of the flooding here. Now, although we can see there's some desilting of the gutter here, it's still a testament of what needs to be done and also tells us that a lot hasn't really changed when it comes to the precautions that we need to take to prevent flooding. The constant dredging, unsuccessful dredging of the Odo drain is seen by many as one way to deal with the perennial flooding that affects Circle and its environment. Year in, year out, this has become a political conversation and the question is, when will we see this happen successfully? Talk of the June 3 disaster and this very area where I'm standing is a major reference point in relation to the flood and the fire. Four years on, has life returned to normal? Nancy Kura now has been two to three years in one as a Hanuma in the past. That's a crash of a festival. Patronage only shot up only two, three years ago. The disaster created a lot of fear and panic, thereby causing the public not to use this stretch. Nothing has actually changed. Uh, I don't think much has been done to do away with the flooding. Just recently, I think there was this race, and uh, still the flooding people are still complaining. Now, the uh, things are not changed because. Yeah, we'll see person put water for this place. We'll see the water side inside the crowd. People, the people, water for water inside. All those things, they are no good. And legal experts have expressed varied views about the refusal of Boko Central MP Mahama Yariga to appear before court on June 4 over tax evasion charges. Mahama Yariga was expected to appear in court June 4 over five counts of tax evasion filed against him by the special prosecutor. Here is a report by Kwachi Afre Nyama. Two page response dated 2nd June and addressed to the special prosecutor, Mahama Yariga reveals Martin Amidu has written to the Speaker of Parliament asking for his release to face prosecution. Mahama Yariga, however, states, among other things, that the Speaker is not vested with the power to release a certain member of Parliament during a period when Parliament is in session and sitting. He explains that on the same date, that is June 4, the House will be sitting. The Boko Central Member of Parliament is also quick to add that leaving his duties to attend to court hearings could constitute basis for his removal as a lawmaker. Reacting to the development, constitutional lawyer and executive director of the Center for Democratic Development, CDD Ghana, Professor Kwesi Prempe says no MP is immune from prosecution. The current one that's in, at issue is an immunity that attaches essentially to the business, the conduct of the business of parliament, right? So it is certainly not, uh, and I'm not saying that Mr. Yaga has made that claim, it is not a blanket immunity as it is with Article 57.5, which is the president's immunity. Professor Kwesi Prempe wonders why Ayariga chose to write to the special prosecutor. I do not see how this becomes a matter of the invitation of the prosecutor. If the matter is already being penciled in before a court, and he's going to be arranged before the court on a set date. That becomes essentially a court order. And I'm not sure that uh, we should treat it as an invitation of the prosecutor. 
But private legal practitioner and a member of Mahama Yarigas NDC party, Abraham Amaleba, disagrees. If we read Article 122, it is clear that you do not impede a parliamentarian from engaging in his work as a parliamentarian or from attending parliament. That's just to summarize. Now, if the service on him would amount to impeding his work and he not being able to represent his uh, constituents, then that will amount to a breach of Article 122. He backs the Boko Central MP's decision to write to the special prosecutor. Don't forget that this letter needed to be addressed to the special prosecutor because it is a special prosecutor who is prosecuting the matter. And so Ayarga needed to write to the special prosecutor to tell him the reasons why he could not appear in court or he would not appear in court. With just hours to the court hearing on June 4, it remains to be seen what the court itself will have to say about the refusal of Mahama Yarga to appear on the first day of the hearing. And that's all for the news at 10. Thanks for your time. On behalf of the crew, good night.